Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma. We are a nonprofit organization based here in Los Angeles that focuses on diversity, equity, inclusion, and social impact in Hollywood, really looking at the power of storytelling and how it can be used as a force for good and social change all around the world. And today, I'm really excited to have a special guest joining us to talk about his new film called Unidentified Objects. Uh, he's an award-winning filmmaker that uh, if you haven't heard about yet, you sure will, uh, I'm sure, really soon. His name is Juan Felipe Zuleta. Uh, Juan is joining us today to talk about, again, his new film, but also about his journey and his background in Hollywood. Um, just to give you a sense of Juan before we we meet him in a moment, um, again, he's a award-winning director. He's based in New York City. He's got a diverse body of work um, behind him, a lot of character-driven, genre-bending uh, work. He immigrated to the United States from uh, from one day in, uh, in, in, as a teenager, uh, and Juan has really, you know, cut his, cut his teeth, if you will, at Paramount Pictures, and then went on to study, uh, at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, um, and has become one of the youngest, uh, after that, one of the youngest ever in-house directors, uh, um, post-graduation. He's also done a lot of commercial work, uh, directing commercials for brands like Budweiser, um, but I know is passionate as well about narrative storytelling, and uh, will tell us a bit about his journey in a moment. Uh, last but not least, he's also received a lot of honor honors uh, in the industry, uh, including a fifty thousand dollars creative grant from the Richard uh, Vague Production Fund. Um, he received a Silver Lion Award, uh, Cannes Silver Lion Award, uh, and has received lots of other honors. He's developing a couple projects as well, which we'll hear about in a minute. Uh, so Juan, uh, really excited to have you on the uh, podcast. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jared. Absolutely. Hope that was a good enough intro for people who don't know about you. But I wanted to also hear in your own words, Juan, tell us a little bit about just your journey so far. Um, any of the highlights there I mentioned that you want to go deeper into, but tell us if you had, I guess, at the very beginning, just a bit about your upbringing. Like, did you grow around filmmakers? Did you have mentors? Tell us a bit about how you sort of started getting interested in this as a potential career. So I grew up, um, unfortunately, where I'm from, I'm from Medellin, Colombia. There's not a lot of filmmakers, especially when I grew up, not, not, not a lot of people who make films for a living or, or want to make films for a living. So I did took some acting classes and, and my, my, one of my acting professors lended me a camera to shoot my first short film. And by the way, I don't want to be an actor. I, I just wanted to do it just to understand a little bit more of what that was. My, I would say my one of my biggest influences was my older brother, Sebastian, who made did the score for my film. And Sebastian, uh, he did want to work in the film industry as a composer and as a musician. So he uh, immigrated uh, seven years before me to the U.S. and and he and and so so I was very lucky to visit him when I was in, in high school and go to his house during the summers when I was not uh, uh, in school. And and I think just being with him really gave me a lot of like, oh wait, there's an entire industry. There's a, a world out there where where you can actually go and make movies. And, and, and it sounds kind of a little bit idealistic, but you do have to have a little bit of that delusion of the, that you can actually make it and see yourself in that world. And and I feel that that kind of like one of one of the of, of the things that influenced me the most. And when I finished high school, I moved to my brother's house, uh, uh, and and I moved in with my brother. We 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 got like a small place in LA together, and and that's kind of where I I went to class at, at Santa Monica College, and I started working on independent movie sets. So that's kind of like how I came. But I, I, at that point, I had I, I didn't know any directors, I didn't know any filmmakers, I didn't know anybody who worked in the industry. Uh, and I, I was about to start finding those people. That's really neat. Um, I, I just love this story about, you know, folks like yourself who kind of seemed like you kind of felt it in, in your bones and then followed that ambition and, and passion all the way to, to LA, New York and beyond. Tell us about those early days, like working on sets. Like, did you you know, did, did, was that, I guess, A, was that helpful for you um, to kind of learn the craft in that practical way? And, and in part B, that question, I mean, tell us about maybe just some of those challenges and how you overcame, overcame them. Because obviously for a lot of people, you know, the, the distance between starting out, you know, on set to directing your own film can be a really, you know, challenging journey. Yeah, so that's, 
I would say my some memories that I have is I started uh, any sets that needed people. When I was at the community college, I joined like the all the film classes. I joined the film the the film club, and there were people who wanted to make films. So I I signed up for everybody who wanted to make films, and that's how I started meeting people. Soon after that, they I I joined my a group of friends who wanted to become grip and electric people. They were young like me, but they were starting to get G and E gigs at in the independent movie sets. I started working with them. Sometimes I would go and like sub with some of them, and sometimes I would get hired or meet the like people there through them, and I would get PA jobs. And and by the way, those jobs are really hard. Like P, working as a PA on an indie film, you're working so many hours, you're getting paid pretty much nothing, and you're you're. I remember like at night walking at night, like throwing out and like wrapping the plastic bags and throwing them out outside, outside and take, taking them to the the trash chute. And I think in some ways that those those are the things that. That it, it kind of like if you still love what you like what this is about and you're still okay doing that and like knowing oh what well, we're still telling a story and and I would love to sneak out and and sometimes I wouldn't even be allowed on set because they, there was not a lot of room or whatever the case but I would still try to sneak in and try to see what was happening and try to see the 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 camera rolling and like the AC bringing this lady in and and rolling and that and then I felt like we're making a movie and and I I'm never gonna forget that feeling of like knowing I didn't have any money I had to drive to my friend back home because I barely could afford transportation LA is very expensive and and I didn't right. have a lot of money um, and 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 all of this combined I still like love the grind I love that and and then eventually I started producing French short films and I started take, putting a, a hat as a producer and I started also producing my own short films so so I think parallel to having a job that is paying your bills and giving you exposure to the industry I earlier, like very early on, learned that the biggest way, the fastest way to grow as a filmmaker is to just make films. No matter the budget, just put yourself out there and like fail. And I made so many bad films. And, and that's something that I feel incredibly proud of because I took the initiative to go. One, one of my films, I raised money by recycling. You know how like those people go to like apartment buildings and they get all the plastic bottles and they pack them in massive bags like home like you think these people are homeless but no there's you can get money like that without having to do anything you just take them to the recycling center and they'll give you cash and that's what you did so you did that to raise money for your and you don't mind me asking like was that did that fund the whole film like how much were you able to raise doing that so my first film in LA was like thirteen hundred dollars and I raised uh, like I did that for like and, and by the way we're talking about like LA is expensive and this is not a lot of money. So I, I was asking for a lot of favors and, but this was like a three, four people crew film. And I did all the casting through. So yes, I, I was able to I, I raise the money that I needed to make the film without owing anything to anybody. Then I, there was another project that I raised money through Indiegogo and I also raised like $1,000. And for me at the time, that was a lot of money. Like, trust me, like that, that failed when I went to like, uh wooden nico which is like a small g e rental place in right. la mm -hmm. and 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 i rented a van and i would pack it and i had to pay 280 dollars for like the three lights that i got that was like oh my god i'm putting so much money into this and it's kind of like and that was kind of like the mentality that i came at this from it's like everything like i didn't know the real cost of making film and 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 even though 250 thousand dollars to 250 dollars is nothing it felt like a lot at the time but I, but I feel so happy that I went through that experience because it, 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 it humbles you in some ways. It, it makes you realize what it really takes to make a film. Yeah, it really does. And that's so, so cool you shared that because I think that, um, you know, it, it is a lot of money when you're starting out. And for a lot of people, you know, it's, it's so challenging early on to, 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 make, to, to make it. Um, so and you, you talked about, before we move on to, the, to some other things I want to cover, but you talked about, you know, just in those early days, like having a gig that actually paid your bills as well. Like, what were you, how were you able to sustain yourself to, to do this work? So, so there, there's a couple of things that I want to uh, add. I was so lucky that my, my sister was born in the U S in 1983. And because of that, I was be able to, in 2011, I was able to get a green card because my parents were really working really hard so that my brother and I could have access to papers in the US. So to, uh, I was able to get papers, through, uh, get a green card. And that I knew 
I knew I had family members. I have friends, immigrant friends who have come to the United States undocumented. I know the benefit and the privilege that it is to just have been be able to have papers and be able to get opportunities that that are paid. So so some so my parents uh, gave me helped me with the rent and they gave me very little money to live, which wasn't enough if you wanted to like go to it, it, eat or stuff. So I, the first job I got was a freelance job here and there working in, 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 in student short films where they, you get paid a little bit in smaller independent films. And I also got, uh, I became, I started working for the uh, Santa Monica College Film Center. Uh, and I started uh, working with their equipment and I worked for, for, for like the, the professors there and I would do whatever they wanted me to do, but they would pay me a little bit of money that I could like have a little bit of more cash. And that wasn't even short film money. That was like living money. But by the way, I didn't have a car, so I would take my bike and public transportation everywhere. And that's kind of like my form of transportation in LA. That's how I arrived to the city. I would get my haircuts at the Santa Monica College Hair School because they would give free haircuts on Fridays. Mm. And all of this because I, 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 again, it's not like LA, United States is expensive. Like LA is expensive. And I didn't want to like be throwing my money out and, or whatever. So it was kind of that how's, how I was making a living at first. Wow. Okay. So you were doing whatever you could, obviously, to, to to make ends meet, but also to save to make films. Tell us about how one you got to this project, Unidentified Objects, which is your feature film directorial debut, which is incredibly exciting. I had a chance to check it out. Um, tell us a bit just about the journey to this film, and then I want to talk about obviously the film itself. But how did you? So how did you go from making short films and kind of scraping by to be able to to make your first feature? So that, that uh, going back to like the the journey started in late 2012, then uh, 2018, we Leland, which is my writing partner, and I, which there's a very cool story that I, I've told before. I'm not gonna spend time talking about it, but we have a screenplay called that is called Frontera, and that screenplay gets we get the Richard Beck Production Fund, which is actually from NYU for alumni who graduated in the past four or five years. To shoot that movie and that it starts getting us interest for more money to shoot the movie eventually uh COVID happened and and leland and i and and the, and the project vanishes like basically like all any any interest that we had disappears uh it was a project that was going to be shot in south america not, not like COVID. we cannot travel you cannot do anything leland and i i i particularly i had a, a, an idea for a movie that involved that little person lead. The reason why I was interested in this is because I took a class in, in, in a film studies class about representation in cinema, specifically talking about like how we, like Hollywood stereotypes characters. And so like the Latinos, most often the gang member, uh, most often played by like the same Rolodex of gang member, like actors who you see, like the John Leguizamos, et cetera, right? Then same thing with like the, the way they're stereotyped, like certain types of black character, the black, the black, uh, like the black black mother, or the etc. So I started like seeing all these parallels, and and one particular aspect that caught my, caught my attention was little people. If you think about it, most movies out there, except maybe the Peter Dinklage movies that have been made in the past fifteen years or twenty years, which is one actor, most characters who play little that people little people play in Hollywood are either freaks or monsters or or something along those lines or elves. They're like the creature. They're not human beings. They're not three-dimensional characters. They're not. They're never going for auditions that could be for the lead role of this TV show or that TV show or this feature film. Almost never, except because Peter Dinklage made a massive break with Game of Thrones, which what happened to be a, a dwarf leading man. But 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 that was like a major exception, and that's one actor. So I was fascinated by that, and Leland and I. When COVID hit, we were like in a place of like deep depression, unemployment, like feeling of loneliness, like desire to get out of this world because there, everything was, I mean, as you know, like COVID hit everybody, like especially in your New, New York City, which is an expensive city, you have all these things shutting down and, and you have the political climate that wasn't healthy as well, that there was a lot of hate in the world. And, and, we, and we find this little person character that I, we had, I had a, like a little bit workshop before. And then that's how Unidentified Objects came to be. It came from like, what if we develop this story? And we started writing the script and the treatment for the script. 
And soon after we had a feature length script that we wrote in a very short period of time. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, and love, I love your focus there on representation, which we really do see come through in the film. Um, Unidentified Objects tells a story, as you alluded to, of this, you know, Peter, this kind of misanthropic dwarf who's sort of hiding out in, in a shabby New York City apartment. And then we kind of see this unexpected visit from this character, Winona, who is um, a bit unhinged, you could you could call her, and, and kind of forces him into this kind of road trip, and impromptu road trip um to to track down an, an upcoming alien visitation in in uh, Canada tell us a bit about that that combination of themes between like you know you have some sci-fi elements there you have some obviously some issues around representation around loneliness depression grief like tell us about did that did that did those themes kind of emerge through the writing um and and also those tonal shifts connected or how did those emerge so so I think the the name of the movie was the first thing that we knew that was the theme, unidentified objects, and and not not only speaks to a uh, aliens, a UFOs, but it also speaks to like those objects, those unidentified people who don't have a place, don't have a home, that feel lonely, and 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 within that, we were able to just expand through these very different characters like what that represents. So like we we ha we had a very specific theme of what we wanted to explore. And that's where the characters came to life. And, and I do think came through the a lot of the writing, a, even like from the treatment, we already knew kind of like what the heart of the story was. And in terms of like the science fiction themes, I love science fiction. I love sci-fi. I love genre, like genre cinema. I'm a massive fan of like Alamo Draft House and, and things like that, that is like, just showing unique types of movies. And I just felt this movie had, like, I never seen anything like this before. So I felt like this was a good opportunity. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I just love how you've, you've kind of bent a genre here and had a lot of neat ton tonal shifts as well. Um, talk about that if you would too, um, one in terms of like this kind of shift between reality, surrealism, you have some neat shots of of, of kind of in both ends in the film. Um, talk about that if you would like was that a type of filmmaking as you to build on your last point that you're interested in or what what why have those those shifts yeah no i i feel um listen i i i you often say that like in for me like cinema like filmmaking it's like a really one of the things you can do with filmmaking with like it's is you can bend reality and dive into a character's psyche and the way they perceive and, and inhabit the world and be able to represent visually how they feel and that is not literal that that is like that you can do that by by like like by it comes from the writing it, it's complemented with the acting but it's like the way you build that tone and that and that and that was like what like and and that and like and that allows you to do more than what you would traditionally do or normally do. So like that, that it comes to even like, even, even there's shots that are famous for like creating certain feelings and certain emotions, right? But then if you take that even deeper, you can think about what are situations that, it, that can be, that can be, that can allow you to explore uh, like somebody, the way somebody feels. And, and then you go to studying like obviously Lynch, but also like Luis Buñuel and, and like surrealist filmmakers, like even, um, I'm I'm forgetting a, a few names right now, but 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 then that was something that I've always been interested on, but but also keep it grounded. And and when when we keep when, for me, it's very important that this is not a 100 percent a surreal film. That this is a, a like a journey and a real grounded almost. And the whole movie shot handheld. Like I want this to have like a little bit of that ituma and being realistic vibe, but I want to incorporate that like like. Uh, surrealism within so so but the surrealism is serving a purpose it's serving this the purpose that is allowing me to uh, 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 let the audience feel and understand how the character is feeling so so that was a lot of collaboration with Leland in the writing of the script and with the actors and the scenario that we created but also kind of like with the tone like the tone of the music and the and the sound escape and and it also you're you're limited by what the movie 
uh, a a journey or the, the narrative lets you do, but this is an alien abduction. We're talking about this. They, they are going to see an alien, an advanced alien civilization that has been known, especially this is what Winona tells him, for like shaping your reality and the way you perceive your reality. But also we're going with this character who is taking, is going, is grieving his best friend's death and is taking pills consistently throughout the journey. So it's kind of like, there's a lot of things that allow me to justify uh, in a in a way that I don't suspend disbelief, what I can do narratively, and and that's kind of like what I like to push and play with. And maybe sometimes I cross the line, and some people might say that, but for me it works. And 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 obviously it was really hard to do. So that's kind of like something that I'm specifically passionate about. Yeah, and it's really cool. I mean, I love how you you know you're kind of pushing the needle. I think artistically in that way, and kind of um, again bending both drama but also tone and also even the structure of your narrative has some circular elements versus just linear. Um, so that's really cool that you're, you're pushing that. I did want to ask you in, in the time we have here just about your, um, your, I mean, you talk about representation, but if you could expand on that, um, you really center, you know, you center a gay man living with dwarfism, a female sex worker. I mean, you really have characters here who are layered, nuanced, but also who, again, are from identities and, and from spaces and worlds that we don't often see centered in that way on screen as full people. So um, I wonder if you just want to expand on that one in terms of like that specificity that you guys, you know, built into these characters and um, what was that process of working with the actors, you know, in terms of yeah. asking them about how they would approach these characters? I, th I think it always comes down to like conversation and finding truth. Those are the two main things that are the most important things when you're building honest characters and, and knowing that you don't know everything, accepting that you don't know everything. So that gives you the curiosity and the interest to learning. So obviously with a little person a character, for me it was a given that we needed to get a, a lead that wasn't just an actor, but was a producer, was a collaborator on the script. And that was Ma Matthew's job in the, in the movie. It's his movie as well. He owns it too. He's like a partner. We casted him, we found him, but, but it's not like where he's just a consulting. You know what I mean? It's not like he's outside of the room as we make the decisions. If anybody had final cut on this movie, it's, it's an indie film. It's me and him. He's my partner in crime when it comes to like, making sure that we nail that identity and when it comes to like the perspective of the sex worker it was it was tricky we did when we were auditioning we 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 did Leland had like knew a, a few people that he spoke with for like consulting but but we we were looking for actors uh, and that's why Sarah Hay came to the top right away that not necessarily were sex workers but that had been had experiences where their bodies were exploited in almost dehumanizing ways because mm. they could find like that human relatability. Sarah Hay used to be a professional ballerina and she's spoken openly about how that industry is so exploitative to ballerinas because they are they they have bigger boobs than what they should or because they're too tall or too short or because they're they're, they're the shape of their feet look in a weird way or not not right. too so so it's kind of like so I was that was kind of like thinking through the casting but also doing a lot of research. And, and, and I feel like with the actors, then giving them, empowering them to bring their life experiences to the table and, and make a true collaboration. Yeah, I love that you took point about collaboration, because I mean, I think that to do, to tell these stories authentically, like you said, with truth and honesty, you do need to have that collaboration. Is, is this an area that you want to continue down in terms of telling stories about marginalized communities or marginalized people and and if so is that do you think in part because of your own background 100 percent. i i i think i live for telling stories of outsiders and i and i actually this is my philosophy and my idea for the future in some ways is like we now glorify superhero movies and they are amazing and everybody and they're always going to be around forever but superhero movies are usually about flawless characters that you cannot, they, they don't have any real problems because they're superheroes. I feel there's there's an, an entire generation of filmmakers that are coming up that are starting to realize that, oh wait, we can actually tell stories of characters we've never, we've never seen before on the screen that are outsiders, misfits, that are marginalized. And we can still make those stories super compelling. And I feel like, Maybe at, right now, those stories are not necessarily mainstream stories, but I think eventually they're going to be more accepted. And as, as this 
as we break and democratize filmmaking a little bit more. And, and obviously, like, even if not, I still personally, I'm just extremely passionate about, about characters that are just not, that I'm not, that you don't see in your daily life or, or, and that are, that have a, a lot to say. Yeah, I really do. And we don't really get that representation and that, um, like you said, collaboration with folks who, even if they're not producers of the film, but if they're involved in the film, such as actors, yeah. that they should have that um, agency to tell their own story with with you. Yeah. Um, on that point of just like empowering, you know, first generation filmmakers like yourself or filmmakers who are marginalized um, themselves, or underrepresented in the industry like what are your thoughts on that um how do, how can we create more opportunities for folks like yourself um coming up in the industry and um, what advice would you give to those folks so so this is a question that i feel is just is really hard mm -hmm. it's really really hard i all i can say is i feel um that my in my experience i feel you have to as a filmmaker you you have two goals one is to always be creating with no excuses, as hard as it is, because I know how hard it is. Even if you don't have money, find a way to make something. And that's your job, your responsibility. Farmers, they work as farmers, no matter the weather, no matter the condition, no matter the, because that's their job. And they go out every day and they lay down the, the, the fields and they put the soil and they plant and they collect the crops. Even if it rains, even if there's a drought, even if not, that's our job as filmmakers is to tell stories. So you always have to keep pursuing it no matter what. And, and the way you do it is by creating. And two, networking. And nowadays, there's a lot of opportunities for to network. Film festivals, absolutely. But don't think about it. You have to go to Cannes. There's local smaller film festivals where you can meet people, collaborators. And, and in that process, slowly, you're going to be building, be building people who are also trying to open and break down the gates and people who are inside the gates who might be empathetic with your experience. And it's as equally as important to be, meet both because eventually, like, and I'm not talking, don't, don't be obsessed with meeting like the top executive at Paramount Pictures. Just be obsessed with meeting like the intern because those people are going to eventually get in and get the, the the cushy job and they're gonna and, and 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 they're gonna keep growing and you're already in the radar and 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 i feel like that's it like work and network yeah great answers i mean i think that's underrated in some ways but um it can be as simple as that and having that persistence to to go after it um what are the i guess last question for you on what what are what are the next projects you're working on and I mentioned a few i think earlier um but also like what are you what are your hopes for the types of stories you want to tell other than what you've shared and, and what you're working on next so i'm working i'm working on two projects right now one it's called a uh, conduit which is the story of a of a future medium a medium in the future who who basically uh through his through becoming a, like a future uh, a medium he has an experience and he brings back the spirit of this girl is an immigrant and documented girl who got uh, killed like by by we don't know why so it becomes a little bit of a murder mystery of this guy becoming obsessed trying to find what happened to her and think about like putting yourselves in somebody else's shoes kind of like that's what we're exploring in this story but in a very authentic way and i feel i'm very excited for that and then there's this other story that i'm working on uh, that is my next movie i hope i should this year or and early next year it's called we were born dead nacimos muertos is my first Spanish-speaking film. I'm shooting in my home country of, of Colombia. And it's a story of two siblings, Luis and Jairo, who one day their mom, uh, they, they are farmer kids who live in the like the middle of nowhere in, in like the most remote town in a specific time in Colombia where there's like warfare and there's like a lot of uh, fishy stuff happening around. And one day their mom doesn't come home at night. So it's the story of them trying to find what happened to her. And, it, and it's set in a little bit of rest in peace, Cormac McCarthy world, where it's kind of like this edge of society, kind of like uh, where, where morality doesn't exist and where this, there's people who are just out there in, in, in crazy ways. He has like a little bit of this magical realist Guillermo del Toro tone to it, but it, in, but it, it, op it, it combines some elements of, my, of an unidentified objects, like that subjective lens storytelling, as well as like that exploring like marginalized perspectives and, and trying to understand how they see the world. 
Well, it sounds fantastic. I'm excited to see what you do next. I'm, I know a lot of folks are. Uh, and congrats on this project as well. Um, it's getting really fantastic reviews. So I hope folks will have a chance to check it out when it's in wider release. Um, again, the project is Unidentified Objects. Our filmmaker today, uh, Juan Felipe Zuleta. Uh, congrats on the, again, and, and excited to see what's what's coming on the horizon for you, Juan. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate your time and for having me. And by the way, Unidentified Objects is right now available on, on transactional video on demand. So you can rent it on Amazon or iTunes right now. Perfect. Okay, yeah. So folks can check it out uh, right now, um, which is good to know. And I hope, hope everyone will. Thanks again, Juan. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.